we will have first round of opening remarks uh hopefully pretty brief under 5 minutes please uh we'll start with anna then robin then gladden then ravi and then bibke and uh, then we will open it to the audience all right so anna can we start with you please namaste to all of you um obrigada who is understanding me i don't know i came from portugal is the other side of the world as you probably read it um so i work in i'm not i'm a lawyer my my background is a lawyer and um i run for uh, european elections and also i was a member of the portuguese parliament and this is for me I, i'm this is a theme that is uh, all of you probably heard about that and i will try to to uh, looking at the hour i will try to to give you five or six main ideas for then to have uh, open the discussion because i prefer to 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 discuss the the discuss with you so woke in politics it's it's arising arising in portugal in european elections in european uh, um institutions uh it's everywhere we we um, we received the impact of the wokeism that is came from united states regarding the last um studies uh there are some some professors and researchers that that think that um these ideas of wokeism are ending uh, but probably can rising again with trump elections but i don't know but i feel that in europe uh, not only in portugal um and we are f ch uh, uh, facing um a period of polarization instead of aggregation this is for me the the main point uh, because the polarization that that coming with the wokeism and this canceling policy um is the opposite of what we want in politics we want aggregation we want to join differences we want to combine diversity and with this it's uh, it's not the real purpose of politics so we 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 get to a, a stage that uh, and to a point that um, if you don't agree with me you are not uh, allowed to speak or to have an, a different idea and this is for me it's not it's not imaginable i'm i'm i defend the tolerance I think the the beginning of everything is for you to respect the other. So for me this is the negation uh of um, of the human kind if you can uh, say like that. I don't want to that that you um be like me. I just want you to heard what I'm my, what what are my opinions and I just want you to listen. and and if in between we can uh, see a uh, shared uh, points okay we have space to live together but um the question is that this wokeism is instead of uh, uh, um of giving you this opportunity to 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 share your ideas is silencing so this is a kind of um uh, uh censorship So th this is the opposite of what you want with wokeism. If you want to because wokeism as you may know um born with the the defense of some causes social causes social activism I know you are saying no David but I know but now this this modern wokeism and the question is that the people who are using this to try to impose something to the other are getting not what they want to 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 share they are trying they are getting the silencing and the 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 people i'm i'm i i run for elections and it's very difficult when you go to 
the streets and, and speak with people, normal people, normal citizens. And this is like the football games. You are from one, one side and the other is from uh, the other side. In politics, it's not like that. We need to be able to share, to talk and to share our opinions. This is for me the main. I, I'm not denying the causes that wokeism uh, is appealing, okay? This is not my point. I'm just, I'm just uh, um, trying to, uh, to, to give you the consequences of what we are seeing. And what we are seeing is the silence versus freedom of expression, where it, where it begins, where it ends. And it's very difficult for you today in the information era to try to silence anyone. So it's very difficult. So it's better for you to, to speak with the other and to listening, listening. I will repeat this word uh, at the dinner before. Uh, they asked to several ministers what would be the, the, the word for the, the, to try to inspire the, the world. I think we need more listening. We need to, to learn to listen the other. And uh, we are, uh, in politics, uh, people are always saying this to me, ah, oh, you are the same, you are uh, speak, uh, speaking like the others, and so on and so on. And people just want to, you to do things. So, but at some point they want you to listen them. This is, and, and in, in those meetings, don't you think that uh, I'm, I, am, I have so many meetings in NATO and several forums, and at some point, if, if you, if you um, get your attention, you will see that no one is listening. Mm -hmm. At some point, no one is listening to the other. All the people who are speaking want to hear themselves. Thank so you, Anna. This is a problem. For ending? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, and I will not speak uh, anymore, I promise. Uh, this is a paradox. It ends up bringing about the wokeism. It ends up uh, bringing about what it, is, it intends to avoid, discrimination against something. So, um, solutions. Dialogue, mutual understanding, listening to the other, flexibility, disinformation, and recognition of plurality. This is the challenge of the next century. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Anna. And since listening is important, let's listen to Robin. <laughs> Robin, your time starts now. Exactly, I had that feeling. Well, thanks very much. And again, like everyone, delighted to, to be here. And on the provocative panel, um, I don't know if I'm gonna be provocative. Um, I'm gonna try and answer the exam question, but from my uh, perspective and my experience, I suppose, working in think tanks, which are on the front line of aspects of, let's call it the woke agenda, but also more broadly, the attitudes to ESG um, in the policy field. Let me make four points. Um, let me just explain a little bit what think tanks do, certainly what Chatham House was doing. Um, don't plant flags at the top of a hill and say this is the world as it should be. Roll up your sleeves and get down in the valley and try to make things different. That means you can't always be perfect. Um, think long term, be integrated, speak truth to power, be credible. Okay, a few little guidelines for think tanks. How to do this? Um, do your best to be analytical, be objective, be informed. Don't do advocacy. It's not our job to advocate, to have a predetermined position. But you have to have a theory of change. Um, if you want to make the world a better place, you're going to think, how are you going to make the world a better place? Um, and our mission at Chatham House, to lose our mission, I stepped down as director a year and a half ago, to build a sustainably secure, prosperous, and just world. We put the word sustainable in as an adverb, not as an adjective sustainably secure, sustainably prosperous, sustainably just. Those all carry uh, meanings within them. It is in a way policy ESG, I think. Um, what do I mean by that? What would be examples? Third point, um, unfettered globalization, you can see analytically. 
led to severe imbalances in terms of people's uh, quality of life. If you disaggregate big GDP numbers into who does well and who does badly, the big numbers might look good, but some people profited much more than others. Uh, environmental uh, damage that's come with unfettered growth. So the answer, go for inclusive growth. And I'm going to use the word inclusive. It's in the woke uh, lexicon. Um, that means thinking about the social impact of your economic policy at home and abroad. It means taking environmental responsibility, the E part. It means about being transparent, supporting the concept of transparency, um, obviously fighting uh, corruption uh, monopolies. It also means, I think, uh, think about inclusive security. Um, protecting yourself at the expense of others is not sustainable security. And yet, European migration policy uh, has largely been us trying to protect ourselves at the expense of others. The global war on terrorism, as uh, uh, followed by George W. Bush administration and then the, Biden, uh, the Obama administration, um, was very much about protecting America at the expense of others. Russia's paranoia and needing buffer states is Russia's security at the expense of others. None of those things produce sustainable security. And we've seen it all over the world. The third sort of policy dimension that's come out of this is the importance of countries engaging globally, um, understanding the limits of national sovereignty. This is in the foreign policy G of ESG, and it is contested. Um, I believe institutions matter. I strongly believe there are limits to national sovereignty and understanding those limits, knowing when to engage with others and when to apply it is part of the skill of government. And if you're gonna tackle climate, health uh, and development problems, you're absolutely gonna to have to do that. So last point, where does this leave Chatham House in the woke ESG kind of culture wars? Um, three thoughts or three things I learned. Um, it's fascinating how what I thought was a policy issue pulled me sometimes into what became a culture war issue. I stood up once and explained the work Chatham House does, that our biggest area of research in the last few years have been climate and the energy transition. And somebody at the table asked me the question, does this mean that Chatham House is structurally liberal? I honestly didn't know what he meant. Did he mean liberal in the American sense, liberal in the European sense, liberal? Uh, you know. So I asked him later on. I said, sorry, I, honestly, I really didn't know how to answer your question. What do you mean? Um, and he said, uh, well, you do all this stuff on climate and the science is not proven, you know. Um, so we talked a bit about the science. I'm not a scientist, but I know that 99.9% .9 of scientists uh, who know a lot more than you or I do absolutely know that this is happening and it is anthropomorphic it is human driven and as we talk more about it i realized it wasn't the science that he was challenging it was oh the concept my. of what he would have to do um if uh he believed in the science of climate change which is compromise national sovereignty and so his attachment to national sovereignty prevented him from accepting my discussion about climate change fascinating trying to break those uh, you know, trying to find balance can take you further away from truth. And even in think tanks, you have to be tough. Uh, which brings me to the second point. I wrote an article about the future of think tanks. I said, it's fine to be objective, but you also have to know where you stand. We stand, I'll say that in the present tense, firmly for liberal democracy. Why? Because I think it is the best and most importantly, most sustainable form uh, of government. I said that word of sustainability. That means governments that are transparent, accountable, accepting checks and balances, accepting the idea of diverse media, and importantly, an independent civil society. I am a member as a think tank of civil society. Therefore, I'm gonna champion any government that's got the confidence and the strength to be criticized by civil society. And we're not gonna be, obviously, as a think tank, aligned at least with governments that do not, uh, uh, that threaten those principles, especially if they do it under the cover of an anti-woke agenda or of a form of promotion of exclusive nationalism. Because in a way, that's just cover to be able uh, to move to what many people have called a liberal democracy. Where do we stand, last point, on the staff? Because you asked where does this come into the sort of older and younger. My view was if we're going to ask, if we're going to be credible and if we're going to avoid double standards, then the leadership cannot be accused of double standards by its own staff. Um, and inclusive staff 
and having a staff that feels that you're inclusive is incredibly important for any institution. We're happy and I'm proud to be inclusive of minorities, uh, of people of diverse sexuality. We questioned our history, wrote a whole thing about colonialism and international affairs. Um, you can't criticize other people's double standards if you're not going to check constantly whether you're applying them yourself. Um, you know, being inclusive is not about imposing um, the perception of minorities onto a majority. It's not about replacing exclusion, uh, uh, an old form of exclusion, with a new dogma, yeah. clearly. And I think these are the points you were making. But um, if you believe in the power of the mission of being sustainable in this moment of transition, as I said at my kind of farewell thing at Chatham House, I'd rather be awoke than asleep. Thank you, Robin. Now, I'm guessing when you speak truth to power, uh, you do possess, I mean, the assumption is you do possess the truth. In some sense, we are also pushing for greater uh, amount of research uh, and objectivity into, uh, you know, the decisions and the debates. Let's move to Gladden. Now, Gladden, please do stick to five minutes. Uh, your time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, my name is Gladden Papin. I'm um, from the Hungarian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, but I was born. I was born and raised uh, in the United States, and spent a long time in uh, in academia there. And I guess you could say that I've I've moved to a country which is probably not number one on the world woke ratings. Um, in fact, from what I'm from what I understand, when the word woke first began to appear. Uh, in Hungary, people weren't quite sure what it could possibly mean. They thought that there was a, a, a huge resurgence of interest in Vogue magazine. <laughs> so they, weren't, they weren't, weren't quite sure what this was. But um, in thinking about this panel, I just want to try to make a couple of points. Um, I'm reminded of the American portion of my life. A couple of years ago, I think it was during COVID, I was watching the Super Bowl. And the Super Bowl is famous for having these wonderful advertisements. You know, every company goes all out. And there had been a kind of pressure campaign in the media in the months before that against uh, working conditions at Amazon factories. You know, these gigantic places. And there, there, there were these uh, terrible stories about the labor conditions, uh, including stories of people. Um, well, you know, Amazon is really good at extracting high levels of productivity from its workers and tracking everything that, thing that they're doing, the speed of their deliveries, and according to some of these reports, how much time is being lost from their workers as they have to go over to cross the floor to the bathroom and things mm -hmm. like that. And supposedly, I don't know if it's true, but they were being docked points for for going to the bathroom. But <clears throat> but in the Super Bowl ad. For Amazon, it was a series of short interviews with uh, with their workers, in which everything was about how wonderful and beautiful it is to work in the most woke. Of course, they didn't use the word, but that was the the sentiment that they were communicating. You know, this is the most uh, tolerant workplace I've ever been in. You know, each and every part of my identity is affirmed. Uh, I needed. I'll just be a little bit elusive here. Someone says. Uh, uh, you know, I needed uh, I needed a huge amount of medical care in order to uh, undergo a, a gender transition. And Amazon covered over two hundred thousand dollars of my medical expenses, things like that. Um, and so you saw that something something strange was happening here that, uh, in it, 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 in the in in the world of corporations that somehow. I don't know. I mean, the, my immediate reading of this was like, oh, OK, well, Amazon management is kind of weaponizing this term to uh, satisfy its um, satisfy its profession. The managers are using this to satisfy the professional class because the professional class uh, in the U.S. now cares more about these markers of cultural identity mm -hmm. than uh, than some of their basic working conditions compared to labor struggles in, in previous years. Um, so I started to think of, of wokeness as a kind of, maybe calling it an, an epiphenomenon would be too much, but there are definitely some industrial and economic processes that are a part of the appearance of this debate uh, in public. Again, this is, a, this is a, um, you know, just some impressionistic an analysis here, but it can't be accidental that these sorts of phenomena started appearing 
in the American workplace and in American industry as the nature of American industry changed. America went through a heavy deindustrialization in many parts and the marquee industries of the United States coming out of the early 2000s and the post you know, dot com boom were the social media companies, the internet companies. There is a super high rapid turnover from the university classrooms where these things were fostered by many of the characteristics of American university life to the most powerful corporations of the age. So at the same time, <clears throat> there are a lot of serious issues that, uh, that are related to this. So certainly the, the, the inclusion of these demands in, in the workplace and public life might have reflected a, a, a previous period in which people were expected to set aside all of their personal concerns before they go to the workplace. And maybe that had gone way too far in the you know, uh, 50s and 60s and 70s and, and things like that. So there, 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 there are some important issues there. Um, my last comment in the 30 seconds or so that remain um, is that if, if, if anything of this analysis is true, it's this, the phenomena around this can't simply be resolved at a political level. You know, it very quickly became politicized on a political level in the U.S. And so you have all of the, uh, um, you have a lot of right wing politicians in the U.S. saying, you know, we're going to crush the woke and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but very clearly, there there are um, there are some deeper roots or sources of this uh, this phenomenon. Um, and as much as I think that it has become kind of um, uh, problematic in, in a lot of ways, and and certainly went uh, too far, there are there are a lot of serious issues that that lie underneath the the surface. Thank you, Gladden, and especially for highlighting the. Uh the impact it's having on corporations. I think that that was uh, so far uh, missing from the conversation. We move to Ravi Agarwal now. Ravi, your time starts now. Thank you, Shamika. Hi, everyone. I'm Ravi Agarwal. Um, I edit a magazine called Foreign Policy. Um, so I have been wondering what I'm doing here on this panel. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm going to try and shed a little bit of light on how I've been thinking about it. Um, as an editor and as a journalist, uh, I do have to think a lot about inclusion, uh, to think a lot about diversity, to think about who gets platformed, to think about who has the right to speak in public, who gets heard. Um, so these are issues that I do care about. But I want to start with just a quick question and maybe a show of hands. How many of you here have heard of the Calvin Report? 1967, Calvin Report, anyone? Wow, not a single hand. Um, so it's fascinating because it seems to me like we are way back in 1967, where many of the debates that we're having now were had back then. This was uh, the height of debates uh, on American college campuses uh, over the Vietnam War. And, you know, you're very familiar with the kinds of pro and anti-war demonstrations back then, um, the effect that had on student populations, the effect that had on universities. And at the center of that was a question that every university had to grapple with, which is, what do universities do? And also, relatedly, what do companies do? When you have students or workers who feel strongly about a particular issue, um, do you let them slip into advocacy, which is a word that Robin mentioned? And the Calvin Report was a report that was put out by um, a law professor called Harry Calvin at the University of Chicago. And their takeaway was that a university, or in fact any organization, cannot take collective action on the issues of the day without endangering the conditions for its existence and effectiveness. That's a direct quote from the report. And if you think about it, the issues that they were grappling with then you know, essentially the takeaway that if we are to continue as an arena for debate, as an arena for people to polish their arguments against each other, no matter how disagreeable they might be, if that is our purpose, then you must allow free speech to not just take place, but for it to be celebrated, even when you, and especially when you disagree. And it seems to me that at the heart of the current moment, whether it is the debate on university campuses about the war in the Middle East, um, or whether it is about Black Lives Matter, 
which in many senses is the root of the current moment of dialogue around so-called woke politics. Look back to when the George Floyd protests took off a few years ago during the pandemic. And to a point, every single university, every single giant workplace in the United States had a stance. Now, it so happens that this was literally a black and white issue where it was quite easy to take a stance. But in doing so, many institutions locked themselves into constantly taking a stance on every single thing forevermore. And they've begun to twist themselves into knots because there are other issues that are much more complicated than the issue of George Floyd and the very particular case of African-American rights. It's interesting to me that the George Floyd protests and Black Lives Matter as an issue gained so much currency around the world, which really speaks to American soft power. Because again, I mean, the, the, the African-American experience is unique. It's very different from, say, the, the way in which Black Britons um, see themselves and their experience um, or Blacks anywhere else in any other part of the world. So we must be very careful about terminology. Uh, I do think the, the phrase woke politics uh, and the term ESG have been completely abused. Um, we've completely forgotten what they actually stood for, where they came from, why they exist. Um, we've allowed people to use them in different ways and turn it into a politicized debate. When in reality, if you go back to first principles and definitions, it is much simpler. But what I will end with is this. I think a couple of things. We have to be very careful in this moment about the fundamental danger to our societies, which is not whether you agree or disagree or you have a different point of view, but it's more profound than that. It's truth. We're in danger of being in a post-truth world. As deep fakes prol proliferate, we're, we're going to see this even more where people will fundamentally disagree about what is real. And we have to be extremely careful about how we tackle that issue first before we tackle anything else. And the second thing that worries me a lot, and this comes back to universities, but also to giant workplaces. You mentioned Amazon, any big company that is in danger of creating a monoculture where whether you're left or right, however you define any of these stances, whether you leave other people you disagree with scared of speaking out, whether you make them feel left out, whether you make them feel that their opinion might be unpopular, they might be shunned for it, whether you're right or wrong, we must all avoid becoming bullies. We've done that in schools when we were younger and we must avoid it um, as adults, um, as conscientious members of universities, of think tanks, of institutions, of companies. And I think at the heart of it, if you look at the resentment on the right that led to the term woke politics becoming as politicized as it is, the left would do well to look at itself and wonder what they might have done to create the conditions that led to resentment. It's a good question to ask at all times, whether you are right or wrong. Did you play a role in the lead up to this moment? And above all else, at the root of it, what is the role of truth? Are we agreeing on truths? Can we agree on basic facts? before we agree on what to disagree about. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ravi. And we finally get to uh, Witke. Your five minutes start now. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, my name is Wiebke Winter and I'm a politician from Germany. I'm a conservative, I'm a parliamentarian in my regional state and I'm also a climate activist. So often I am considered maybe a vogue person and within my own Christian Democrat party, which makes this discussion even more interesting for me because I really have a problem with defining vocism or accepting the whole concept of it. Because I often feel that certain topics are connected with the term vogue, for example, gender issues or climate issues. Um, and I think that both of these topics are really important topics that we all need to address. I'm a young woman in politics myself. I know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about uh, gender issues and probably discrimination at some points. Um, and I'm also a climate activist, so I know how it feels if people tell me, well, don't overreact, don't panic. Are you really that afraid? Um, and I think that it's... It, it saddens me even that when we when we put certain topics to to a term which is used in a heated debate like vocism, um, because I feel that we all need to speak about these topics, whether we are conservative or liberal, 
whether we are left wing or right wing, social democrats, Christian democrats, it doesn't really matter because we all need ideas for these topics and solutions to, to the crisis that we are facing. Um, and therefore, I often feel that when we use the term, this is vogue politics, we are just trying to minimize the problem or saying that it's not really there, but it's just something that people use to say, oh, well, you're just a little bit overreacting. Um, at least that's what I'm seeing in the, in the conversation we're having in, in Germany. Um, and therefore, I'd, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to advocate for not using the word anymore, but to listen to each other. And of course, there are people who make their point very strongly, activists in Germany who just glue themselves onto, their, onto the streets because they feel that this will help their cause. It doesn't, it doesn't. Um, but does it help if I just call them out and tell them, well, you're all stupid? Um, I, I, I honestly don't think so. I think we all need to stand up together and we need to speak out. And sometimes people, at least in the debate in Germany, say that their freedom of speech is limited, that they are not allowed to say some things anymore. Especially when you're coming from a free country with such a great constitution like Germany. I think it's really, it's really dangerous to say something, some, something like that, saying, well, I, I don't have the freedom of speech anymore because we are all allowed to say th something. And of course, debates can be hard. And if you're going out there with an opinion of your own, of course, there will be somebody in the room who's deeply disagreeing with me and probably telling me afterwards, oh, what you said, that was so stupid. I really disagree with you. But I think that me standing here and giving you my point of view allows you to give you my, th your point of view. And I think that we need to be a little bit more robust as society uh, and that we need to respect people who speak out for their causes, even if they do so like in a very, very harsh matter. Of course, this also has limits. So um, Ravi, what you just said about um, the American universities, I've seen that with my own eyes. So I, I went to Harvard University in last autumn, um, and that was shortly after the war of, in the, in the Med Mediterranean. And there was this group of students who, who wrote a letter and taking side with, with uh, the people in Gaza and even with the Palestinians. And of course, this is something I disagree with, um, at least in what they have written so far. Um, but their names were put on, on cars and companies, big companies blacklisted them. And I think that this is going too far because this isn't a good conversation anymore. Um, but I think anything below that, we just need to, we need to take into account and that we need to see it as something wonderful, that we live in a society where we can speak openly about what we are thinking. And therefore, I hope that after this discussion, maybe we don't use the term Vogue so much anymore. <laughs> Thank you, Ipke. So much for the, the title, Samir. <laughs> um, so now, one thing which is quite reassuring uh, is that all five speakers have quite emphatically spoken against the culture of cancelling, which means, going back to Anna's point, listening is important. And if we stop listening, uh, it's very difficult to find that common ground to move ahead as a society. Uh, we'll move to uh, Q&A. We really want this conversation to be as uh, inclusive and, and we really do want people to ask away. Do raise your hands and I think, do we have mics? Yeah, we have mics everywhere. We'll start with you, Pranjal. And, and do let us know whom do you address. Well, I'm Pranjal Sharma. I'm an author and economist based in India, New Delhi. What I can't understand, there used to be a time where people were left of center or right of center. But now the wings have grown, so it's left wing or right wing, and everybody's on the wing tips, uh, as it were. Uh, very, very extreme. What I can't understand, and I'd like any of you to explain, this aggressive intolerance of the liberals, uh, where, which is also the cancel culture, but this aggression that if your view does not match mine, you are absolutely a demon. Um, this used to be actually the stronghold of the orthodox conservatives. What explains this aggression of intolerance of any counter narrative by the liberals who are supposed to be the most open progressive uh, humans in the world? I would like to share with you the same aggressivity that you see in uh, uh, liberals or rights. I can see it also in the uh, extreme left. 
I don't know. So I, I was talking about the the left, uh, the liberal left. Ah, sorry. So, ah, so sorry. it was. That I understand the opposite. Sorry. Who used to be who used to be very tolerant of any other view, were accommodating progressive would think twenty years ahead, but now they are thinking. You know, if you do not agree with them, you should exist. That's the problem when you you are not listening to the other, and the question is that you want to impose your uh, uh, your opinion, uh, and the polarization I, I was speaking about is is because of that. We are not allowed ourselves because the political correct is to defend as as you all of you appointed. Um, I, I am from center. I'm a moderate. My my party is a social democrat, but in Portugal we are from uh, center right. And uh, the funny thing is that I I'm totally agree with you. I I'm I I work for um, the National Defense Committee, and uh, as you can imagine, I face a lot of problems being a woman, being young. To, to speak with the uh, I generals and so I face all of these problems and I want to say I defend all of these causes okay this is for me this is not the, the an issue or even a discussion we need to be transparent we need to be everything but the question is that the world is not black and white fortunately the world is yellow is green is uh, pink so This is the diversity, and the question is that we are, I think, for the uh, the, the think tanks and the, the people who are thinking about this, I think that this idea of polarizing everything in two in two sides, it came not only from sports, of course, but it came from the Cold War. This idea of two to part of the things and, and put things more simplify or simple. And the question is that the world is more than that. We are here, I'm here in India and I'm, I'm seeing this. Uh, I came from the other part of the world and India is, is rising so much and have so much diversity in, uh, in uh, 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 the country. And Portugal has 10 million of people and we are so different from each other. Why we need in politics that is related with people, with humankind, why we try to fix and to put everything in two sides. I think world is more than that. Thank you. And anyone else? Can Ravi? I just say one, one very quick thing? I, I, I don't know if uh, you're kind of painting all liberals in, in one with one brush here and and For every liberal or far lefty you'll find who uh, adheres to cancel culture or aggressive cancel, cancel culture, there are enough lefties who argue against that as well. So, so it's, it, it, there, there are shades here. But if I were to try and just mount, uh, not a defense, but, but, but a little bit of understanding of where some of that might be coming from, I think that the people who tend to react in the ways you're describing are reacting at a very fundamental level to a sense that rules aren't being followed. So, um, impunity. If, for example, in the United States, someone uses the N-word, which is, you know, the thing you just absolutely do not do, um, and they're not punished for it, right? So, so that, that, that there's a sense then of, well, we, we need to figure out a way to cancel them. If you look at the root of Me Too, um, at its heart, it was combating decades and centuries of injustices that were not being dealt with, right? And so when, when people were pulled down from positions of power, rightly so, there may have been the odd case where there wasn't due diligence, right? Um, hence the, the, the outcry over cancel culture. We mustn't forget, however, that historical injustices in general needed to be corrected, were being corrected because the system didn't provide for a route for them to be corrected. So. I, I kind of resent it when people sort of mostly just focus on, ah, those far lefties, uh, they're, they're sort of fostering cancel culture. We've got to step back and look at the bigger picture, look at where that was coming from. And that said, I don't want to cancel anyone, absolutely anyone. I mean, I, 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 free speech absolutist. But, but we must try and understand where that's coming from. Vipke, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you. First of all, I totally agree with what Ravi just said, and I would like to add a thought on that because I feel that 
it's also a thing about who is heard in a society because often there's there's a minority or a majority that isn't that that loud because why are we hearing the people who have these ardent feelings or are the extremists often at least in my world i'm a 27 year old um what i hear is via social media and how is social media working they are the extreme emotions that get a lot of traction that the algorithms will favor uh, and therefore i often have the feeling of course I, i don't have a statistic to that but i know that the algorithms work that way that extreme feelings get shared more because especially what triggers anger is, is is pushed more by the social media platforms and therefore we hear them more we hear them louder and we share it because we say oh wow this this can't be have you seen it that's outrageous what has happened there um and therefore we even spread the message even though there is a majority who is probably feeling in, in in another way and i'd like to i'd like to give an example for that as well so what we have felt in germany is that the right wing um extremist party that has arisen in the past 10 to 15 years that there were so many people supporting it and we felt like like we couldn't we couldn't we didn't know what to do with it and then there was there was this call for people to go onto the streets and they have for a very long time have not been demonstration that large in germany all over germany against right wing extremists after they called out for that and it showed that there's this more quiet majority on the streets and uh, streets and i think that we need to think about that more and we need to always consider who do we listen to and what do we share and what is shared on social media so what do we hear and not what's actually there <clears throat> um well i think the questioner sir is 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 pointing at a at a real phenomenon um and there was a study a couple of years ago about the um political donations made by the faculty of, of my alma mater and my colleagues alma mater Harvard. And I think that the, the results showed something like in the 2020 election, something like at least 97%, maybe 98%, something like that. 98%, maybe 98 and a half percent of the uh, campaign donations made by the, the faculty of Harvard University went to the, the Democratic Party. And I can conclude that this only indicates fear, um, that, there is, that there is some, that some fear of engaging in uh, a conversation with conservatives or including conservative voices. Obviously, that's not the, that's not the case. That's not the case here. But it is the case in many institutions. Um, and we can, we can I, I think that there, my colleagues have made many, many justifiable and, and important points. Certainly, you know, the, <clears throat> uh, many of the campaigns that were undertaken by liberals in modern times were oriented uh, in good directions or, or pointed at, at resolving important uh, injustices. But many of the events of the world today are not really um, able to be analyzed in, in liberal terms they are events are going in a direction that doesn't fit into the categories of political economic social geopolitical expectation that were formulated by liberals particularly in the 1990s nevertheless they're still in charge and so as the as the system becomes rocked by so many things that it didn't expect you know it didn't expect that mass migration would lead to deep cleavages at the heart of European societies. It didn't expect a return of nationalism. Um, it expected that giving everyone the ability to construct their own identities through consumer choices would be satisfying. I mean, all of these things were like maniacal expectations that have proven to be false. But in many, many um, context of intellectual discussion, if you point that out today, you're immediately moved into a kind of uh, bad category. So I think for the sake of the, the good things that the, that the system has accomplished, the good things that have been accomplished in modern <coughs> times, it is important to have more of a, a feedback loop. Um, and I do worry that the, that the more that we exclude um, I don't know, responsible expressions of these of these viewpoints, the likelier we are to get something that's uglier.
Thank you, Glenn. Now, uh, on the statistics, we actually did estimate on social media, negative news actually travels 15x faster and wider audience than uh, neutral or even positive news. So uh, that's a Brookings paper from four years back. I think we should open the floor to further questions. Uh, I did go on the right. Is there any on the left? I really do not want to be okay. They, the left is pretty contented. Okay, let's, let's, let's hear from you. First of all, thank you very much for bringing this type of topic. It's, it's so true that each of us has this issue every day at home, at work, at universities and in, in any situations. The question I have is a little bit from a different point. Uh, I am from New York. I am in management consulting, worked in 46 countries, seen a lot of people, taught at NYU, Columbia, so I have different careers. One thing that I really didn't understand in my entire like day-to-day -day work and job and family and friends, what we're going to do with leaders of countries that are lying to our face, that are planning to destroy, they have nothing to build, they're just aiming other countries to kill, to destroy, to take over, and we are consistently at the UN, at the EU, in all of the meetings, treating them like they are heroes, taking pictures with them, accepting their story when they know they leave that meeting to go and do what they just said. So what do we do? There are about 10 countries with horrible leaders for 30 years driving their agenda. And we can sit here as common people, as educators, as professionals, right? Oh, so let's concentrate not only people to people, let's just think from the above. Why are we tolerating that nonsense? That's against humanity, against society. What we do with them and what is the name for them? Great question. And of course, it's symptomatic of what is fundamentally wrong at the UN. Uh, yes, please. The gentleman, yes. Yeah, hi, uh, Ronald Kopaldas from Signal Risk. Um, very quick question to all the panelists. Um, the role of social media in giving rise to extreme politics and where you see that going and evolving. And secondly, how much of this kind of loneliness pandemic that we're seeing in the developed world do we attribute to the rise in, in this stuff? Rise of social media? Rise of social media okay. and then loneliness and giving Lone, rise to it. kind of tribalism almost. Got it. Maybe one more and then three questions. Yeah, the lady. Next, yes, please. Uh, my name is Dina Amgad. I'm from Egypt. Um, I'm here also, I'm working with uh, in the League of the Arab States. And um, I was really interested regarding the idea of a limit sovereign uh, state. Uh, I think um, Robin mentioned this. Um, and you believed in the institution, uh, you know, the work of the institutions that can make a difference in the world or in the international sphere. So, for example, on the recent uh, conflict in uh, Gaza, um, first I want to thank all of you that you agree on giving the speech for different people with different backgrounds and different ideas. And you have morals and you accept the morals of accepting others. So regarding this, um, the limit of the sovereign state, as Robin mentioned, so do we need to do that with uh, states that are um, committing genocide against different people like Gaza for all the people who have died there? So do we need to make a limitation or make um, some pressure on the states that commit genocide? against Gaza people. All right, so now we have three questions. One in the UN, we'll come, if we still have time, we'll perhaps take another uh, round of questions. Question on uh, the UN and eventually what do we do with such leaders? And of course, I'm guessing in democracies, there are certain ways and means of, of handling a problem like that. Uh, social media and loneliness. Uh, in fact, there's an excellent body of research uh, 
the world has never seen so many people die alone without a kin since this pa- i mean in before the pandemic so this is a much larger problem social media i think has aggravated but what you're talking about is a is a fundamental problem that angus deaton 2015 nobel laureate calls deaths of despair the breakdown of the family so it goes beyond social media and the third is of course the genocide the gaza problem so who amongst the panelists will be brave enough to take which question okay we start with webk then we go to robin thank you very much um because because i've mentioned the the issues at harvard university i feel that i should i should uh, give my stance on 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 the issue of israel and gaza and um i think that we need to, need to also see the perspective of israel who were attacked by the hamas of course not by the people but not by the civilian people who have nothing to do with hamas but the hamas who were coming from from palestine came to israel and they murdered so many people more people died in one day than ever after the holocaust and i think we need to always take this into consideration and i think what we all need to deeply criticize is what hamas has been doing and what they what they are doing now that they're still keeping hostages um and that they are they are still hiding in their country and using civilians as their shields and i think that you can at the same time feel for all the civilian people in in Gaza but at the same time understand <laughs> what Israel is doing and that they also have a right to protect themselves because they were attacked they were attacked massively and i think that we need to take that in co- into consideration and just because of what i said earlier i don't want to be i don't want to be a misunderstood i just wanted to make this point really clear um that that i think that there needs to be a freedom of speech but of course freedom of speech also has its limits especially when you and or at least in my in my value and in my opinion and what my constituency is saying a uh, constitu- constitution is saying um that that denying israel the right to exist this is not something that is protected at least in germany by the freedom of speech um and i think um that this is also okay because it denies a whole population the right to live and i know that this is a very con- tr- controversial topic and that there might be different views on that issue as well but uh, i think that this is okay but i just wanted to share my point of view on this very difficult issue uh, and i just wanted to raise that point let's go to robin well just quickly dina i'm afraid i'm going to disappoint you on the prospect for institutions on issues of this sort where we've seen institutions be most effective including in the part of the world that has the most evolved mixture of sovereignty and not sovereignty which is the EU the one area where that is practically non-existent apart from taxes <laughs> um uh, is in defense and there was a big push by Tony Blair back in the early 2000s uh to do a thing called liberal interventionism which then was taken up in the UN and became a thing called responsibility to protect the idea that governments to do not have the right to do whatever to their populations or populations in their place and you would the international community would take them on the first place it was tested was in libya it went wrong because the basically the uh, mission mission crept and they uh, killed um uh, gaddafi you know uh, at the time and then the whole country collapsed everyone watched what happened and said you know maybe interfering in other people's countries on security is counterproductive so then on syria did did the world intervene in syria as hundreds of thousands died uh in Aleppo and other parts of the world no one got involved um and i think uh you know even if you look at the numbers of dead in Mariupol 28 to 30,000 people died in Mariupol in the space of 2 months we've had a similar number that died in Gaza uh, i'm afraid that when it comes to security um it is incredibly difficult for other countries to involve themselves and actually try to to create an institution that would do this the only one that exists is the UN Security Council where it was designed so that the big powers couldn't take on each other and so far and this brings me to my last point i think the problem people have with the united states is not that israel doesn't have the right to defend itself is that it's defending itself and breaking humanitarian law in doing it and if you're a country that believes that the Geneva Convention of Humanitarian Law are a core part of the post 1945 society then 
if you're actually supplying them with weapons to do it, it puts America in the position of committing double standards. But I'm afraid there's going to be no institutional solution to it. All right. Anyone else? Um, I, I just want to say one quick thing uh, that might sort of draw a line across the three questions. Uh, and that theme is truth. Uh, you know, I think the problem, uh, for example, you, you raised the issue of genocide. You called it a genocide. Um, you know, I, one struggle we have, and, and genocide is, is a legal term. It's a term that, you know, was created in part to push countries to be le morally and legally obligated to do something. Um, the issue, of course, is that um, there's disagreement over whether what is going on in Gaza constitutes a genocide. And I think that that's issue number one. Um, some countries will say, yes, it is. Some will clearly say it won't. Um, and I think that's also linked to the questions about social media and leaders lying to our faces. The, the issue of us being in what is beginning to feel like a post-truth world, where we're, we're fundamentally disagreeing about basic truths, unless we figure out ways to counter that, it's going to be very, very difficult uh, to be able to advance on any other points. Um, social media in particular has been a, a real driver of untruths, uh, you know, fuzzy truths. Uh, and we must figure out ways, whether it's regulation, whether it's forcing uh, these companies to have armies of fact checkers, um, whatever it is, we have to urgently figure out a way to solve this. And then the last thing linked to all of this, um, and Webke, I really respect what you said. We have to be able to say that what happened on October 7th was absolutely awful. It was unforgivable and that it, it was a an attack on 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 the Jewish people and the Jewish state that was, you know, truly historic. We have to be able to hold that truth uh, within us while also acknowledging the truth that what is going on in Gaza is absolutely awful and is too much and something needs to be done about it. And those are two truths. And I wish that most people who acknowledge one side of the truth would acknowledge the other. That would help. That would be a starting point that would at least begin to allow us to have more dialogue rather than groups saying one truth and not acknowledging the other. That's the problem. Anna? Just just to status and try to answer for your question too, because I'm I'm feel appealed to that. I'm 42 years old. I'm a little bit older than you, but uh, unfortunately. Um, but the question is, I'm in favor of the two states. Okay, solution for me, it's not an issue. I'm a commentator in CNN every week about the Middle East Middle East war and even in Ukraine. I was the first. A politician to go to Ukraine when the um, when the war starts. I was at the Munich Security Conference days before because I was the Munich Young Leader, and I um, um, when um, I, I I just want to say this because I think that we need to do it by ourselves. Sometimes you need to have the courage, and I will fight for your freedom of expression. Even I didn't agree with you. So saying that, every week in television in Portugal, and the Secretary General, uh, General of uh, United Nations is a Portuguese, Antonio Guterres, is a, a friend. And I, I am criticizing every week his position, his uh, uh, um, hybrid position regarding the Middle East war and the Ukraine war is is very strong attacking Israel and not so strong attacking Putin. So, and and I'm I'm very um, ashamed that uh, United Nations lost their paper of mediator of negotiator because of that. So, and let me ask you. But the question in European Union, no, okay, no, no. Anna, Anna, you'll have to just um, to finish two seconds. Yes, two seconds, three. Just, just to say this, um, it, it, it's very important. Why Hamas didn't didn't accept the conditions of negotiation? No, no, no. But the question, no. Of course, I agree with you. That's the problem of the polarization. Um, thank you, um, and thank you for the panel. I just wanted to bring it back to a question about thinking about woke politics and 
what we're actually talking about here. So I think you raised some very interesting points, both around specific issues and also the broader topic. Um, and I guess I was wondering is, first, to what extent are the people we're talking about when we talk about woke politics, do they self-define as woke? Or is it something that me, as someone who lectures students, calls my students woke when actually it's putting a label on them that they may not put on themselves? And what are we trying to do when we put the label on it? And are we reducing the interests that sit behind woke politics by giving it a label? So it's another pattern that I see, at least among some of the students that I teach, is this idea that the political parties that we have or the political institutions that we have don't represent the way that they think about their political interests or what they want to represent them. And so I guess with this whole panel, I found it a bit interesting that we're sort of talking about woke as a thing that we can talk about and a thing that is potentially negative, but maybe doesn't represent the interests that underpin the interests of young people that are coming up. And I guess I find it in this room where probably none of us would self-define as woke because we're probably too old for it. Um, what's actually going on here? What sits behind woke politics that might be genuinely interesting and we should actually take seriously? And how do you sort of see that space? Because I haven't really heard much about that in this panel. Um, and I'll leave that with that and hopefully, thank okay. you. Okay, all right. Uh, one is guessing that every country has political institutions which perhaps take care of this representation that you're clearly concerned about. But if it is in the academic interest, uh, I think defining does, it should not be a label which is just an uncomfortable thing that we put a label to when we do not want to deal with it. So in that sense, I think it's a, it's a great question. Uh, but if we bring it to pragmatism and, and, and the way institutions are run, and, and perhaps the way countries are run and policies are made, then one assumes that the representation of this group, whether you call it woke or whatever, that happens through the political process and that voice is very much part of the spectrum uh, when big decisions are made. But I'd like to hear maybe 15 seconds from each of you because it's basically going back to the fundamental issue of is woke just a, a difficult label? Uh, when, when it comes to important policy decisions. We don't want to deal with it. So I will be brief. I think that we sh should use the label Vogue much less, but rather debate. Good. Ravi? Well, I, I think I said at the start that it's a very badly defined uh, word. And, uh, you know, you're right that people who self-define as woke uh, aren't usually included in, in that conversation. We must remember how this term came about. I mean, it was an African-American word. Mm -hmm. Um, and and we've completely moved away from it uh, and, and, and its impetus. Um, so I, I would very much like to retire it from its current usage. Um, and again, this comes back to the point I've been making. It's about truth. Uh, we, it's a red herring to, to have this debate uh, and think it's a good faith debate. It's not. Gladden? Um, well, as I said earlier, I think it's a kind of epiphenomenon and that it came out primarily of the American university system, which is very particular. I mean, it's a, it's a residential experience where uh, very privileged and somewhat spoiled uh, young people uh, sit around for, for four years and, uh, and in combination with ever more radical professors, uh, cook up a bunch of ideas. And uh, so as much as we can dismiss as much and then and then and then from certain institutions immediately assume positions of power, you know, in a very in a very powerful system. So while we can dismiss the term or replace it with another, the set of underlying conditions which tend to produce radical ideas on American campuses and tend to project them powerfully throughout the globe through a, a very powerful economic and political system haven't really changed. Robin. The word woke is not going to be retired because it has become the pejorative term for those who want to keep things more as they are um, to slander those who want to change them. So why would you get rid of the term woke when it's so useful um, in, in a polarized political environment which we're in? Um, I worked at Chatham House with a lot of young people. I had to sort of manage that process um, that Ravi and others have described of, of trying to absorb the concerns of, of all the colleagues who worked with me. Um, they're tired, and I was 100% with Ravi, tired of the role of men persistingly being better, better paid, better opportunities. Women can't stay in the workforce and do careers. Uh, if you go to America, and you're right, a lot of it is much more American, but it's to do with gun control, for example. 85% of Americans wanting control on guns, but a very small percentage of folks uh, in Congress keeping things as they are. Uh, the right to choose, 
um, in terms of abortion not. Uh, the economic failure for young people, young people feeling they, they're not the ones who have the favoured future. It's those who've already got the pensions and have bought the houses. No wonder the young people are pissed off. Um, and they rebelled. And they may have rebelled around things that then got crazy and they've gone too far as rebellions always, all revolutions go too far. And by the way, I could add uh, support for Israel despite what is done with that list. Um, but they are rebelling and they woke up. <laughs> um, yeah. And as I said, I'd almost <laughs> rather be awoke than asleep. I'm more with them, to be frank, uh, than I am with the other side, because I think some of this stuff has to change. But the word has now been twisted into pejorative. It is a rallying cry for those who, on balance, would rather keep things more like they are. Anna? In law, in the first... Are you listening? Yes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Yes, yes. So, no, you, you make the question, I will answer you. So, in law, we have a, a rule that we learn in the first year. Is It calls, uh, no, no matter what the names you, get, you give to the contract, what it me, what it's means for interpreting the contract it's uh, the substance okay so i don't i'm i'm with robin i prefer to be woke in terms of wokeness to be with my eyes open than to be sleepy so this is for me the real meaning but of course this is a fashion word now is in fashion to uh, for me woke is the 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 word that is using to try to silencing Uh, silencing and to uh, uh, cut the freedom of expression. And if this means uh, uh, wokeism, I am not woke, okay? But uh, I prefer to be, uh, to be woke. So, <laughs> as you said, <laughs> then be sleepy, of course. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, this was extremely interesting. Uh, it did get provocative, but that's the idea of these late night sessions. Uh, clearly, wokeism isn't going anywhere. Uh, but I do think as the definition evolves, and I think as political representation uh, gains ground for this, this disenfranchised or unhappy uh, bunch, I think that's how we're going to move together as a society and listening. I think that was a very important point. Uh, creating that platform, talking to each other, that is so fundamental to moving ahead. Thank you all. Thank you.